If you are not comfortable being live, um, this is being recorded and it's being streamed, but I'm so happy to have you in our space here with our guest speakers, which I will start um, kind of sharing a screen with every. Oh my gosh. Recorded and it's being streamed, but I'm so happy to have you in our space. Is that, can you all hear that feedback? Yeah. <laughs> My, I hear myself. Okay, let me see how I can maybe mute that. All right, maybe that works. I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen right now, just because I have a question for everyone that's popping in right now. And also, I want to share who your social work team is today, because we have some incredible guest speakers popping in to share their insights. And I'm super, super excited to go. We're going to start off with Sarah um, to talk about interventions. And I am going to be admitting people as we're going. So if you have questions, please use the chat. I'm kind of moderating as well. My name is Lauren, and I am a school social worker in Texas. And as you are popping in, if you don't mind sharing how you feel about this school year, going into it, either one word or an emoji, use the chat. I want to see everyone kind of interacting with us um, today. That's going to be our meet and greet. And we're going to start off with Sarah sharing some interventions. Okay, so let me pass over to Sarah. I'm going to mute myself um, so she can kind of take it from here. Hi. Hey, everybody. Oh, this is so thrilling. I have to set a timer for myself because once I start talking about interventions. I get so excited. So I'm watching my timer at the same time. Hello, I'm Sarah. I was, a, I was, I feel like I once a school social worker, always a school social worker. I was in the schools for 14 years in elementary school and during that in Southern California. And during that time, I fell in love with play therapy. I also feel like it kind of saved me because I was very burnt out from never the kids, right? It's never the kids from the system as I'm sure a lot of you feel, um, and very tired of behavior charts um, and all of that. So I started taking play therapy classes and whew, it really, it, it, anyhow, up for another day when I have more time, I'll gush and gush about what play therapy did for me. But there's a few interventions that I wish I had known right when I was starting, you know, cause I was buying a lot of, um, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything bad about anything that's pre-made, but there's like a lot of really overpriced, pre-designed kind of therapeutic stuff. And, and I was buying it like, you know, the self-control game. Oh gosh. I, I'm not, I don't know if that's actually really a game. I'm not, I'm trying to make these up. Um, but you know, but they were so specific and kids weren't digging it. And I wasn't really digging it when we play it and it would just kind of get dust on the shelf and the more I learned about play therapy and kids, turns out you don't need a lot of like fancy schmancy games. Um, and there's some great manualized curricula out there for sure. But I'm a big believer in like, how do we take stuff that's really adaptable that you might just have around anyways um, and turn it into something therapeutic? So, uh, okay. So I'm going to share with you and I sent a little intervention over so you can have um, almost like a cheat sheet for this because I get excited and I tend to talk kind of fast about these interventions. So not to worry, you'll have these details. I know Lauren will do whatever wh whatever she likes with um, what I sent her. So the first I'm going to show you, I didn't come up with this intervention, but in this bag, Sandra, you'll know this, is the game Don't Break the Ice. I wish I could see, but maybe if you're in the mood to put in the chat box, like a thumbs up if you know this game. It comes in a box when you buy it. Really reasonable price point. You set it up as an ice skating rink. You put the ice cubes inside. How I've adapted it, um, this comes from a play therapist named Sue Ann Kenny Noziska. Um, I didn't create this, but she... Um, when you see the handout that I created, there's, I put images in there. So it'll kind of make a little bit more sense. Um, and you, it's the, I could not have lived without this game as a school social worker. It sat on my file cat filing cabinet. And when kids would come in, whether it was a first scheduled session or just a drop by, right? Like a lot of our milieu visits. Um, yeah. Hey, Jocelyn, I see one of my favorite games. Um, and I usually just say, Hey, when, when we're getting to know each other, it can feel like I still get nervous. And I, I do still get nervous the first time, right? And so do they. And so we'll just take turns and we'll tap, tap, tap a piece of this ice out. And on the bottom, I've added a sticker. The game doesn't come with that. Um, and then I have a little code. Um, I have an image that you can see. Um, 
but it looks like this. I just make like a little cheat sheet and the stickers align different prompts. Um, and so when the ice comes out, if you're in the mood, you'll respond to that prompt. So this game is very exciting for me for lots of reasons. As a play therapist, we can notice and be curious about a lot as we watch a child um, problem solve, you know, because eventually all the cubes will fall out, right? But how, gosh, are they thinking um, ahead of time? Are they able to kind of um, gauge that if they slam it, it's all going to fall through? Are they rooting for me when it's my turn or are they really rooting against me? Um, you know, what's their tolerance like for when it all does crash? Are they jumpy, you know, with that noise? So when they set it back up, oof, so much to see when they're setting it back up. Not, we're not, we're not analyzing, we're just curious. Um, so for lots of reasons, I love this game as a play therapist. The reason I wanted to introduce it today is to go along with the next intervention. Oh my God, I'm checking my time. It could have been like 20 minutes, but no. And it's because I want you to create interventions that are adaptable, adaptable, adaptable. So you can have this one game and the document, I keep calling it a cheat sheet, but that I sent to Lauren has a variety of presenting concerns. So you, the game stays the same. The stickers are the same color. You're not swapping that out, but you have a variety of laminated, ideally, index cards that have like the coping skills prompts, the social skills prompts, the getting to know you prompts. So same game, different prompts. Okay. I feel like I still have two minutes and I can't not show you these. And, um, keep some animals around. If you're new this year, find like the best T-Rex, the best sloth. Same idea. I have little notes hidden in their arms, right? Or in his mouth. Oof, if we had more time, we would, you would know what's in here. Um, so I use this all the time. It's really easy to have prepped. I just keep a bunch of baggies around with different, I love my label maker, right? So like coping skills, getting to know you, termination. So same idea, super adaptable, right? So you have a variety of prompts. I keep them all in a basket. So whatever I'm working with that day, pulling out the prompts, hiding them in the little animal's mouths or arms. And I usually hide those around the room. I just call it hide and seek animals. Um, so if clients can start, you know, if it's a planned session and they're finding the animals, I use this, I've used this up through eighth grade. Um, you don't have to. It has to fit for your style. Um, or it's a really easy one to kind of just throw together last minute if you have your baggies and your animals at the ready. I did it. Was that okay? I could talk forever, but I'm going to stop. It is hard. I feel like I can go <laughs> on forever and ever. But <laughs> truly trying to respect everyone's time because there's so much to share. And, and thank you so much, Sarah. I shared the document. I definitely shared that. So hopefully it's clickable. If it's not, we'll figure it out because we are social workers. I want to launch this little poll out um, because I know Sarah was kind of sharing a little bit. We asked her to share interventions that might be helpful. So now we're kind of looking at people answering this poll question. Is this your first year as a school social worker? I know interventions always get people a little bit nervous. Um, what do I do once you have the kid? We're so excited to get the kids right in front of us. And then we kind of don't know what to do within our first year. And so I see that we're kind of slowly answering this question and I will um, share what these finals are, but thank you to everyone joining as well. Thank you to Sarah for the great, wonderful resource. And if you are watching and streaming this live, then I will definitely go back and, and post all these great, great um, links that Sarah gave me. So thank you so much, Sarah. I do want to move on to our next um, speaker. So we're going to start off with some speakers. I'm going to share their information on the screen because I definitely, we are your team this year. I want you to rely. Everyone that I chose as a speaker has a great social media presence and they share so much. So definitely start following us for sure over on Instagram. Check us out right now. If you are watching and something resonates, screenshot, tag us. We are here. We love to kind of spread the word. So I'm going to head to a social worker, school social worker that is great at spreading the word, great at getting interventions out there. And that is Sandra in California. Let me go ahead. Where's Sandra? Hey, so I'm Sandra, who is the person behind Quirky and Social Worky, and I'm both on Instagram and TikTok, on TikTok and Instagram both, but mostly TikTok. I tend to share just a lot of like relatable videos about being a school social worker and what that's like, and because we all have 
some great stories behind being in school. Um, but definitely, I wanted to share a little bit about working with teachers and staff in schools. Um, and Lauren kind of gave me some guiding questions that people had been asking. So definitely, especially for new social workers or when you're at a new school placement, um, we want to talk about one of the biggest pieces of advice that I can give you is to first get the lay of the land of the school. So I know a lot of times we come in with this like savior complex because we are helpers. So we feel like either we need to know everything or that we need to show our worth by doing all of the things. And I'm here to tell you, don't do all of the things. I know it's going to feel super counterintuitive, but it is really going to prevent burnout because it is so easy to just go, 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 go. And then that's the expectation that you are going to set for yourself. And, and that's not going to be conducive to anybody. So you definitely want to make sure you're getting the lay of the land of the school. You want to get to know the culture of the school. You want to get to know who are the leaders of the school, who are the decision makers. And that doesn't mean you're an administrator. You're, you're going to see that there are staff members that are really, really Im embedded into the school culture and their leaders, the kids look up to them. And you want to get to know who those people are. You also want to get to know where do people hang out? Where do the kids hang out? Where do the parents hang out after they drop off their kids? Um, you really want to get to know that part of the culture of the school as well. And you want to start thinking about who are some people that you are trying, you are starting to see that align with your values, who might be able to help you implement some of the things that you're interested in doing. And then the number one piece of advice when you're starting a new school or for anything ever when you're doing anything in school is building relationships. That is number one, building relationships with staff, with families, with kids. So when I start off a school year, no matter how many years I've been in, um, I always start the school year. The first month of school, I spend every single day at recesses, at lunch times, at drop off and at pickup, because that is going to be the best way that I'm going to be able to build relationships with students. Even if it's like I was at a school, I recently left my elementary school, but I was there for 10 years and I still, the first month of school, spent every single recess out there in uh, the first month at lunchtime at the cafeteria because then the cafeteria staff gets to know me, the teachers get to see me out there, they get to know, I get to know the kids, they come up and ask me questions and I start building relationships with them. And building relationships is what the foundation of school social work is going to be. Um, and especially authentically, right? I know in grad school, we're taught like we're not supposed to um, disclose ourselves to our students or anything like that. But kids know when you're being inauthentic. So you want to try to be as real as possible with boundaries, right? So speaking of boundaries, the other um, questions that were coming in about working with teachers and staff is um, when they have unrealistic expectations of your role. So if they're having you come and address issues uh, and then the behavior doesn't change right away, right? How many times have we had to intervene with a student and the teacher's like, you're bringing them back, you gave them candy, you gave them a toy, you played with them and nothing happened. You didn't change this kid right away, right? And that can be so frustrating for us but sometimes the best thing that you can do is validate their frustration. So my way of always um, kind of approaching that is always, again, the building relationships and validating their frustration to say, hey, I understand where you're coming from. And the more that you validate them and say, I'm when I'm at schools, I never say that I'm there for the adults. I'm there for the kids. But for the teachers, I always put it as like, I'm here to help support you support the student right? Because it always comes back down to the students. But I am there to support the teachers to be able to help them in their classroom because they're the ones that are with them most of the time. So you do want to be able to validate their experience and validate their feelings of frustration because it can be frustrating when kids are having these unexpected behaviors for them, right? So then you want to validate that and come up with a plan for them that works for their classroom. And every classroom is going to be different. Every teacher is going to be comfortable with different interventions. So you want to tailor that to every teacher. Not every single intervention is going to be the same. Um, the last thing, because I know I'm running out of time, but the last thing that I wanted to talk about is kind of setting boundaries with administrators. And so I'm here to tell you that it is okay to say no. It is okay to leave at contract hours. It is okay to not volunteer to do those after school events. It is okay to not want to do all the extras, especially your first year. 
honestly, I always told all of my colleagues that I worked with, it takes you three years to really get the hang of anything. So year one, you're just like, what is going on? Year two, you're like, okay, this is kind of familiar. And year three is when you're really ready to like come into your own and start implementing things that you want. Because year one, you're just learning all the acronyms that are happening at schools. And year two, you're like, okay, I got, I, I think I've got some of it. And year three is where I feel like your passions really come out and then you can start implementing those and integrating them into your work in schools. So the best way that you can manage that with administrators is to really talk about and set the expectations up front. So I would meet with my administrator at the beginning of the year if they were a new administrator and say, okay, what are your expectations? Okay, cool. These are what my expectations are. And then you come up with a plan on how to bridge that. And then you do check-ins throughout the year to say, hey, like, these expectations and this plan that we came up with aren't working. I'm feeling burnt out. I don't think I can get this done. Can we prioritize what's going to be better? So sometimes that would include like, hey, I have these legal documents that I have to do, which are 504s, or I have to do counseling for IEPs. So in order to get that done, what can I drop of these other things that we were talking about? Because you are one person and you cannot do everything. As much as everybody wants to believe that we can, you can't. You need to have the balance, you need to be able to say no, and you need to be able to set everybody up for the expectation that you're not going to bring yourself out. So that's the number one advice that I can give. Make a plan, reevaluate the plan. It's never going to work, right? Like even when we make plans for kids, unexpected things happen, crisis will happen, somebody will transfer in that all of a sudden is taking your time. You don't know. So reevaluate the plan. Don't be afraid to tell your admin that you're not going to be always doing the expectations that they have for you. I think it's a balance and a conversation. And I think sometimes social workers, we feel like we just have to do what they tell us and you don't. It's okay to say no. I'm going to be like uh, the guru of telling you no is a complete sentence and that's it. No, period. And I'll just leave it in there. <laughs> Yes, I love I love that. And and I'm sure we're looking at the polls for first year, right? So uh, about 60% of us, uh, I, I'm feeling we're doing this like, yes, because those that haven't started up, you don't know how much is going to come flying at you. So thank you, Sandra, for sharing everything that you just shared, because it's so important to hear, um, especially when you're new starting in. But even if you're seasoned, it, uh, it slip right back into wanting to do other things for everyone. One, but we are one person. And that's honestly how we advocate for more school social work jobs in our district, in our schools, because then they're like, oh, there's one Bianca, there's one Lauren, there's one Sandra, I want more of you. Okay, well, let's hire more. It's very crucial and important. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yes, some great, great stuff already. Guys, I'm going to keep sharing some polls and sharing the screens. Again, I mentioned we are a whole team here. These social workers that I chose to speak today are just, I mean, they're stellar social workers. We've talked about, this is a little bit of our interventions. Um, I don't know if you're seeing that. Are y'all seeing that? Yeah, this is our, our agenda. We talked about interventions. We we're talking about working with teachers and staff. And next for the newer social workers coming in, and maybe for those that are not so comfortable as well. I want to kind of share a little bit about home visits, okay? So right now as we're starting in, we've also, and if you're just joining and you haven't yet and you feel compelled, please use the chat to share with us where you're tuning in from and things like that and any questions you have for our speakers. Um, but, and introduce yourself. That's this whole point too, is we want to build community together. This is your, let me see, where's my nice little spreadsheet with everyone tagged on here. So if something's resonating with you, please, please share it right now on your social media. If you have one, all, almost all of us have our Instagram handles. So tag us as well. We'd absolutely love that. And with this, I'm going to send us into our next speaker from California as well. And that is Lillian. And she has some slides that I'll be sharing for her as well. But first, let me pop up um, Lillian's information and I'll let her introduce herself a little bit. Hi everybody, I'm Lillian. I'm behind the School Social Work bubble page. Um, I changed it recently. It was Syrian Cali School Social Worker, but we've moved on from that. Um, yes, I am in California. I'm on the complete opposite side of Sandra. I'm in Northern California. Um, and I serve two middle schools right now. 
And I also see clients on the side through teletherapy as an LCSW. So I am going to be talking about home visits as a school social worker today, because if there's one thing that got me super nervous as a school social work intern, it was doing home visits. So I always feel like that's a good topic to share to either people going in their first year or maybe people that don't feel comfortable with it just yet. So I have some slides there and then feel free to throw in questions like Lauren said. So um, I'm going to go down to the purpose of why we might be doing school, uh, why we might be doing home visits as school social workers. So if you can just scroll down to that second slide, please. Okay, thank you. So um, you might be doing home visits as a school social worker for attendance intervention, case management services, drop-offs. So right, you wanna drop off clothing, food, um, other materials or necessities that a family might need. And then a good reason for um, home visits as a school social worker is communication, building rapport with the families, even with the students and engaging with them. And then sometimes you just get those random reasons. Like I've had to, I did a favor for a school psych once and um, took over paperwork for like an IEP to be signed. So those are some of the reasons why you might find yourself doing home visits. Um, I feel like attendance and case management are my main reasons why I do my home visits. And then if we move down, I'm just going to share a couple of tips going into doing home visits. So everyone has a different preference. I personally want to set something up with the family or let them know that I'm coming. Um, there are other professionals that do home visits and they're kind of like, oh, I just show up. Like they might be from the attendance. We have my district has a tennis department, so they just kind of like to surprise show up. Um, but I do like to have that communication with the family just because I don't know, it's not always comfortable for everybody. Um, and then my second tip is take your bees, your badge, a buddy and business cards. Um, sometimes the family might not be home, so you can kind of stick your business card there. My district has made like door hangers that you can just stick on there and then pop your card in. Um, and then a buddy, sometimes if you know the family pretty well, then if you're comfortable going alone, go for it. Um, but that's really up to you. And then always email an admin when you leave and when you get back just for safety purposes and so that there's not like questioning of your whereabouts. Uh, write down your address before you leave because I've done that a bunch and then I try to find Wi-Fi somewhere in like a parking lot so that I can find the address because I forgot. Document, always document. If it's not documented, then it's going to look like it didn't happen. Um, and that's just also for your own memory and just remembering what interventions have been attempted with a family or that you dropped off something and follow up with the student and family. So that's going to depend on what the reason for the home visit was. Um, I've done home visits for grief where a, parent, where a mother lost her husband and I had done a home visit to do some case management services, did some referrals. So then I'm going to try to call the mom um, and just kind of see it. Did, she, did anyone from the agency reach out to her? Did she go to wherever referral I gave her to check in with them? And sometimes it's the student. If it's attendance related, then I'm going to, when the student finally comes back to school, I'm going to check in with them and uh, make sure I follow through with that same conversation that we had at the home, but now in the school setting. And then mileage. Don't forget to do your mileage. You should be getting paid for that. So keep track of that. Um, I don't know how I am on time. I'll try to go faster. Are we good, Lauren? Yes, we're good. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we're doing good so far. And so much great stuff. So thanks. Keep going. Keep going. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then things to consider. So, right, um, you're going to have a diverse population in your schools. So be considerate of the culture of the home. So sometimes they are going to, they might not want you to wear shoes. I always ask like shoes, okay, on, off, um, just to be respectful. And then the home, like I work with a lot of Afghan families and they don't really have furniture. So it's kind of like they have mats out in the living room and they sit on the floor. I just blend in with them. I just go into whatever environment that they have created in their home. And then another one is they will definitely offer food and drink. You're going to get families that will offer food and drink. Even as you're walking out the door, I've been handed a banana and a water bottle. And I just, I'm like, okay, thank you. Um, so it can be disrespectful to not accept in some cultures. 
Another thing is that some families may welcome you inside and others may be more comfortable with talking just at the door. So we kind of call that like a porch visit. So you kind of just get a feel for that when you get there. Uh, there will be a lot of chances that there's a language barrier. So if you have a translation service with your district, I usually like to have them ready and on the phone. And then I'll just kind of mute them while I knock on the door, do that whole thing, and then let them know like, oh, I have a translator with me um, on the phone or in person. And then just kind of have that ready to go. Um, another thing to consider is if you do end up making an unannounced home visit, it's going to be awkward and uncomfortable. So really just try to go with the flow and be flexible with what the family wants in that moment. They might not want you there and they want to reschedule or they prefer to meet at a McDonald's or a Starbucks or a park, whatever it is. Um, and then situations change for families. So you might show up at an address where the family's not there anymore and you want to try to maintain confidentiality as much as you can or minimize um, how much information you give out. So it could be a completely different person living there and the family just never communicated to the school or the district that they moved. So that's another thing I've encountered quite a bit. And then just be aware of parking, pets, gates, like gated communities, building managers, neighbors, right? Sometimes we see some nosy neighbors that might peek. You might have some pets that aren't on a leash and they kind of jump on you. So um, I think going just mentally preparing for all of those things, sticky parking, all the all the good stuff that we encounter. And then I think I have I think that was was that it. <laughs> I can't remember my own slide. Itself. Yes, that was yeah, the okay. last slide. Awesome. And they're just chock full of so much incredible information that you don't think about before heading out there. So thank you for kind of putting that in. I thought that's so great for new social workers to see. I think I do a lot of the porch visits. And again, you do have to fill it out, uh, feel it out a little bit with the families. Some will welcome you in and with COVID, it, everything kind of changed a bit. So I like that refresher. Yeah. And I know I talk pretty fast. That's why I had the slides there. <laughs> so, And is it okay if I share those slides out as well? Hold on. Okay. Perfect. Those are just perfect notes. Also, these are some things that you can use to kind of share with your staff and let them know what you're doing when you're doing home visits and stuff like that. Some staff may want to tag along with you. I've taken a school nurse, school counselors before, um, just so they can kind of also see where our students are coming from. It's so important to have a holistic viewpoint of our students. And thank you. I'm looking at the chat and I'm reading where everyone is tuning in from. It's so beautiful Our our that we kind of extend so wide as far as school social work, and yet there's still so much to learn from each other. I feel like it's kind of like now coming out. That's why I love this social media space and to use this space in this way. Um, I see some people already connecting and knowing each other. And I love that that's what happens in the school social work world is after a while, you're like, oh, I know her. I know her. It's just beautiful. So if you're new, great. And I'm, I'm going to pop more poll questions out and then hand it over to our next two speakers. Um, we have two more speakers speaking about two very, very needed topics topics that I, I'm going to, like, I have my notepads been going here, taking notes on documentation and organization. <laughs> Those are very, very big. Um, so I want to pass it off to Joyce, who is next and kind of sharing um, a little bit of an intro, Joyce, and then go ahead and take it away on documentation 101. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, everyone. My name is Joyce. I am a school social worker um, with seven years of experience now. I also have a private practice and train new school social workers, as well as provide resources um, and on-demand trainings for them. Um, I'm excited to talk about documentation because it's not something we typically get excited about, right? Like, that's probably the part of the job where we are like, oh, God, I have to write my case notes now. Like, it's not not what we look forward to. And so we can let it feel like a hassle and a waste of time, or we can see it as a tool that we can use to track student progress, to target and refine interventions, and to cover ourselves legally and really make it useful because it is required. Um, I get lots of questions about what format um, and system I use. And I would say just use most school districts, although not all will have something they want you to use in Chicago public schools that we have a system called SSM or impact. Um, and so that is what we will put our case notes into, but you should follow whatever 
um, system your school has set forth. That being said, there are school social workers where there's no expectation that you're really writing case notes. And I would push you if you're in that position to still write case notes, even if you don't have someone telling you to, because it is part of our code of ethics as social workers that we are taking notes on our sessions so that we are accurately reflecting them and ensuring that we're providing quality services um, so that we can produce records for legal reasons, which I'll get to um, in a minute. Um, and also making sure that we're doing all of this in a way that is maintaining confidentiality in terms of how we're storing the records and including only relevant details. Um, you may or may not be aware that there are two types of case notes. So there are the case notes that you would put formally that could be shared or requested by a parent, by um, the court, a court of law, um, and maybe is shared with other social workers who might be working with the student. Administrators might be able to see them on occasion or, or request to see them. So that's one type of note. And then another type of note is personal notes. So you are able to keep personal notes that are separate from the student's records um, and no one can request those. They are just your personal notes. You might keep them either in um, a physical notebook or in, I like to do just a, a little document that I save on my desktop. And those could be anything from those little notes when you first meet a kid, like, okay, the brother's name is John, just those sort of things to keep track and be able to refresh your memory. And when you go back to that student, you can also use it to keep um, more sensitive notes, like maybe a particular trauma that a student has disclosed that you want to be able to really go back to at the next session. But of course, you don't want all the details of that to be publicly available to anyone who has the power to request um, records from you. Um, so those are just two things to be aware of when you're writing your case notes. So when you're writing your personal notes, it's whatever is helpful to you. When you're writing your case notes, what I really recommend is the DAP format. So data assessment plan, and we're writing them very objectively. So where was the session? When was the session? Who was there? What was the environment like? How did the student present? What interventions did you use? And then doing an assessment of what progress was made during the session or maybe compared to previous times that you've worked with the student and then your plan for follow-up. Either you're discontinuing services or you're gonna continue to see them weekly or you're gonna follow up on this little homework assignment that you gave them, whatever that might be. Um, and this is the stuff that could be requested. And so I'm keeping my being mindful of the fact that I don't want to include a ton of details or anything that isn't completely necessary um, to be in that case note. I really like that my big tips for these are making sure that my progress is measurable, if at all possible. So, you know, Susie was able to um, take her turn 10 times out of 12 times, for example, or, you know, this student stayed for the duration of the session and taking one water break, or the student was able to identify um, you know, examples of five out of six emotions, whatever skill you're working on, making sure it's measure measurable and then connected. If your student has a goal, which they probably should, um, that, that what you're working on is connected to whatever their goal area is. And I also big tip would be, we do a lot of really creative things. So like, um, Sarah was describing so many awesome skills that you can work on with students, but probably in your case notes, you're not writing playing with dinosaurs, right? Like that's not how we write it. We write, I mean, you could, but like we write what, what skill we're working on. So that way, when, you know, someday a parent requests that they're not like, you just play with dinosaurs with my kid for, you know, an hour a week for a year. That's weird. Um, but instead you're saying, you know, working on social skills or impulse control or, you know, identifying, um, emotions or, or whatever it is, that's just the way that you did it because we know that so school social workers were very creative in the ways that we help students to meet their goals in, in an engaging way, but we want to focus really on the skill area. Um, and again, I'm always thinking about the audience. I'm always thinking like, oh, how would I feel if another social worker read this or if a parent read this? So, you know, I don't need to include all the juicy gossipy details that my middle schoolers give me, um, just the really important stuff. Um, and finally, I just try to use observations and not judgment. So if a kid throws a chair across my room, I'm writing that he threw a chair across my room, not, you know, he was a total brat or he doesn't know how to follow directions or things like that. Just really fact-based stuff.
Um, so I just wanted to address before I close out a few common, common questions that I get. Um, one is if you don't have a system that your school is using, where do you store your records? And I would recommend um, desktop of a, you know, district owned computer, preferably. Um, I would recommend if you want to do them on paper, doing a um, just like a notebook that's locked away in a file cabinet so it's not accessible to anyone. Um, you could also, if you have access to like a HIPAA compliant Google Drive, you could use that, but be careful about just using regular Google Drive or other places online, you know, storage systems that might not be um, as secure as they need to be for, to hold what are essentially medical records. Um, when do you include private details? I include private details when it's I'm doing a risk assessment. So if I am assessing to, you know, in my case note that that everyone can see, I'm just putting, you know, that the student came out as, you know, high risk or something like that. But in my private note um, that I'm keeping, I'm putting exactly why I chose to identify them as high risk, what what factors were involved, so that I have that record if I need it. Um, similarly, if, if a student is disclosing abuse or something that's a potential legal situation, I'll put down as many details as I can remember for my private note because I have been called to testify before. And so you do want to remember all those details. But again, I'm just putting um, the details of, that I, of what, I, what action I took, you know, that I called um, the Department of Child and Family Services or, or whatever because of something that was disclosed to me. And I don't put those details in the um, accessible note. Um, and then which interactions do I document? Um, I make sure that anytime it's more than a check-in, I write down uh, that that interaction occurred. So if I'm just saying, hey, how's your day going? And they say, oh, great, I'll talk to you later. That, you know, you don't need to write a note on that. But anytime that I'm actually uh, feel like I'm doing any little bit of an intervention with a student, I'm recording that. I'm recording when I do consultation with other professionals, be that a supervisor of mine, a colleague of mine, um, or another family, or the family, or um, if I'm making referrals, I'm writing that down. Definitely the home visit is a great example, right? So that's an intervention you did. You want to make sure that you're documenting that, as well as if there's a crisis situation, I try to be really um, detailed in how I handled it. So I called the parent at at this number and didn't get an answer. So I tried this number and then I told my principal and then I did this with the student. So those are the sort of things that I make sure to include when I am documenting because we just want to have a record of all that stuff that we tried because again, these tools, like these can become a tool for us to, to inform future interventions and also to show the good work that we're doing. And so I think when we take um, writing case notes seriously, it can, I mean, well, I'll be honest, it still can be a little bit of a hassle. I do try my best to do them like at the end of every day. It doesn't happen every day, but I try my best to do that because really hard to remember, even if you take notes for yourself, what you did a week ago or a month ago. So I try to do the end of every day and I try to make them as detailed as possible on the intervention side and progress side, not so much on the, you know, personal side, so that I can actually use them and not just view them as like, oh, just another paperwork thing I have to do, but actually something that's going to help improve my practice and the services that I provide. Um, so I just lastly wanted to share with you all a link I will be sending out to my email list tomorrow, um, an example of a case note that I think is a good case note and all the elements that are in it that I think make it a good case note. So if that's something that you would be interested in receiving, go ahead and you can sign up there um, for the email list and be on the lookout for that free resource um, coming your way tomorrow. Awesome. And if you want the link and we are streaming on YouTube too. So I'm sure people are like, I want that link. I can't type in. I don't have a chat, but we do have a chat. I'm like trying to monitor all these windows and I love all these resources. So I'm going to share Joyce's information and everyone else, all the other speakers as well as we're going through, but I'm sure you can send her a direct message and she'll send you her, her link to her uh, mail list. So exciting. Yay. Awesome. Great, great. Okay. Thank you so much for everything you're sharing, Joyce. All about documentation and making that like, I mean, super important stuff. And the way you just shared it was easy to just digest and kind of like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Awesome. So I have a little question. 
for everyone that is tuning in here and also on YouTube, because um, we're kind of speaking in general terms, we're kind of sharing because this is important for all school social workers to know at all levels. But if you can chime in now in the chat, um, what students will you be working with if you know so already? And I'm going to launch another poll for those that are um, registered in here on Zoom. So you can easily click um, or check which one applies to you. Sometimes it's the whole district. So check, check, check. Um, sometimes we're in that box. So let's go ahead and kind of see where everyone's at. I'll close this poll in a little bit and then share the results as well. And as we're getting ready to head that way, I also want to share a little bit of where we're at on the agenda. I know we jumped in because there is just so much to cover. Um, but we've talked about interventions, working with teachers and staff, home visits, documentation. We have one more, which is going to be our social work organization um, with Jocelyn. And then we're going to go into some of your questions that you all had asked. Um, so I'm excited for that as we round off. And then there is a giveaway, too. So for those that are registered early, um, I have your emails on there. If you don't want it to be shared in that sense, um, let me know. But I do have your emails, and that's how we're going to pick the winner for today's uh, three giveaways. Okay, so two planners and and some a little kind of surprise giveaway as well, but that's towards the end. Um, right now, I do want to send us into our last big kind of segment here, which is going to be that social work organization piece. Okay, and so another great resource coming up, and that is Jocelyn of School Social Work Solutions. So I'm going to let her take the screen and kind of share her information as she's introducing herself and talking all about organization. How do we get started for the first day? Kind of what we're all really here for trying to get a good feel and handle of. So go ahead, Jocelyn. Hi, good evening, everyone. I am Jocelyn Saylor, and I'm a school social worker out of Connecticut. And today we're going to talk about um, organization as a school social worker. So staying organized <clears throat> as a school social worker can be challenging, especially when we're dealing with multiple students, families, different stakeholders, and then sometimes you're working in multiple different schools. So I've come up with five different tips um, that will hopefully help you stay organized. So the first is having a planner or a calendar, whether it's physical or digital, it'll really help you keep track of important dates, deadlines, meetings, IEP meetings, parent-teacher meetings, even if it's a scheduled phone call. Um, it really helps you stay on top of your schedule if you have some type of planner. Um, I personally like to use a paper planner, but I also use, um, my district uses Outlook. So I also have my appointments in my calendar as well, because sometimes I'm on the go and my phone will give me a reminder that, oh, you have a meeting coming up in 15 minutes because I may not be sitting right at my desk. So I use both to help me stay on track. A to-do list would be my second tip. So as you all know, as a school social worker, or maybe you'll soon know if, you're, if this is your first year, each day can be very different. So first we wanna make sure that we have a schedule and we're trying to follow our schedule, but obviously we have to be flexible because things come up. And when things come up, we have to know how to prioritize. So having a to-do list where we're prioritizing our most urgent matters and then followed by the things that are less urgent really help to keep us on task on a day-to-day. -day. Like I said, even though we have a schedule, sometimes you walk into the building and it's something totally different. You might be walking into a crisis or there may be a situation that's gonna happen throughout the day and the administrators are asking you to be a part of it. Um, so having a to-do list to just make sure you're staying on track is very important. Um, Joyce really, really touched on this with keeping good records. Um, keeping good records is super important. As Joyce stated, you know, it's in our code of ethics. Um, we need to be documenting what we're doing with students. And I do that through using different templates. That works for me. So I have a call log template that I jot down, my phone calls that are coming in and going out on a day-to-day -day basis. I have a daily activity log where either if it's a student coming in, if I've done a teacher and staff consultation, whatever that activity is, I'm jotting it down, maybe with a little quick note, so that if anyone said, hey, did you meet with Susie Q on Wednesday because she said she was meeting with you when she wasn't in class, I can just look back at my daily log and say, 
oh no, she wasn't with me or yes, she was with me. You know, she had a crisis and I wasn't able to let you know she was with me. Uh, so keeping those logs and making sure you're staying on top of everything that you do because we do so much as a school social worker and there are different times where you could be called into court due to a matter with a student and it's happened to me. Um, it was a child protective case and I had been removed from the case for over three years, but I kept really good documentation, was able to go back to that and go on the stand and testify to some different things that had to do with the case that I was involved in. So it's really important that you keep those records and it's really best practice to keep them for at least seven years because you never know when you could be called to report on a situation that you were dealing with. Um, keeping a confidential file for students in a locked filing cabinet if you're not keeping an electronic record is really important and those confidential files you can keep student demographics conversations you've had with them um, community resources maybe there's a therapist involved and you have a release of information keeping that in the confidential file so if anything ever happens you can pull that file and you can review different information and be able to provide other individuals information on that student um, if need be, you know, obviously maintaining confidentiality, but sometimes in crisis situations, we do have to break that confidentiality. So keeping those records in a confidential file and utilizing those templates daily. The next thing I would say is using technology. So there's so many different apps and software that can help you stay organized, whether it's on the Google Drive, there's Trello, there's Evernote, some people are more digital. So utilizing those apps to stay organized and on top of all of the different things you're doing on a daily basis. Lastly, I would say staying tidy. So keeping a clean and organized workspace can help you be more productive and focused. So taking the time each day to kind of tidy up, file documents, put put away materials. Um, I always had some type of closet with the activities um, that the students were doing. So I might have a bin with art supplies. I might have a bin with puzzles. I might have a bin with um, games that help build rapport. So everything stays organized because I had through the years you develop and you accumulate so many different games, activities, resources, keeping all of those organized and tidy will help you stay on track. And I do wanna add just one last thing uh, for staying organized is keeping a personal portfolio. So as school social workers, you might be running assemblies, um, you might be the head of like a themed week in school, school spirit week, working with administrators for an attendance event, running groups. There are so many different things we do as school social workers that enhance the students and the school community. It's important that we document that in a student, por in, not a student portfolio, in your own personal portfolio. And then when it comes to your evaluation time, you can always look back with your administrator and say, you know, I ran X amount of groups this year. Um, I created all of these different assemblies to help with our, our school cultural and climate. Having that documentation and being able to pull that out during your evaluation is really going to help you get evaluated even higher. And it also helps explain your role to your administrator as well. So keeping a personal portfolio. And then also, if you ever want to leave your job, it's something great to have when you go on to another interview to talk about all the things you've done in the past. So keeping your own personal portfolio, I think, is a huge tip for school social workers to show the work that we do every single day. And that's it. That is so amazing. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for sharing that information. I like the portfolio idea. I think that's, I mean, the more you know, that's really awesome because we do so much and then it's hard, it, kind of like with, with a resume, it's hard to kind of recall everything that you've done. So kind of keeping that documentation. And yes, everyone's kind of going on about the planners, which um, Jocelyn has been so, um, so gracious and able to kind of give us two digital planner giveaways today. So we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Okay, yay, exciting. So we've talked about on our agenda today, we've talked a little bit about um, 
a lot of different things. So I'm sorry if you are, if you all are feeling a little overwhelmed right now, there is a lot that we're kind of going to be tackling this school year. And I know that's how we started off, right? We started off by kind of asking everyone, how do you feel with the new school year coming up, right? We've talked about some interventions, shared some PDF files, working with teachers and staff, home visits, a documentation piece, and then the organization piece. And now I just we want to open it up to some questions for these last 30 minutes that we're going to spend together. Um, and then just the reminders, right? Follow all the speakers on here that you have been um, getting information from. And there, there are more. There are some more, but that's the full list of the speakers that we have had kind of sharing all of their insights and information. And they do so also on social media spaces and then with their own resources so, so well. So this is your school social work team for this back to school kickoff. And with that, I, I kind of got some questions from the audience before in um, as you all registered in. Right. I asked if you will have a question for the panel, panel, what would it be? And I've selected a few kind of before. So I'm going to throw them out to everyone um, that's on the panel to kind of chime in. And of course, you can use the chat, too, if you feel like, you know, this is something you want to chat and share about as well, a resource or whatnot. That's why we're all here together in this space. But the question um, really was, what advice can you give a future school social worker in the field? And we do have a, a few new social workers. I'm going to share those um, results right now. Um, but I'm going to open it up to the panel to kind of share just one piece of advice you would share before we dive into some more detailed questions for our next speaker um, that's coming in, Destiny. I'll start. <laughs> Is that OK? Yeah, sure. Um, advice. Oh, my gosh. One that you're in the greatest profession of all time. And it's also it, it's also the hardest. And so to know that you can, I always say this on Instagram, that you can love it and loathe it all at the same time. And it's really hard to have your family and friends understand that, I think, because they'll say, your job is so stressful. Why don't you get another job? And you'll say, I could never, like this job is my whole everything. So that you can hold all that at once. And so I think to... I think it becomes isolating sometimes with our friends and family because so much of us is wrapped up in this. So like get to know this community. It's amazing. Like the friendships and connections that can come out of this um, Instagram community of school social workers. So connect and befriend and kind of find your people so you can debrief because um, it's really complicated, beautiful work that you're going to be doing. For sure. For sure. Anyone else have a quick answer to just a piece of advice for future school social workers jumping in? I think that you need to know that you already have skills in you. Uh, maybe you don't know certain protocols or you don't know like a specific intervention, but regardless if you have, you know, maybe in, uh, done your internship at a school or work with kids or not, you know, you, you have skills that you already have in you um, and just every year is just about building it. Right. So don't go in. There. I know my first is like, I know nothing like about work, you know, this, but really when you're in a situation, just apply the skills you have and then you'll build around the community need to the district needs, you know. Right. Very, very important to really kind of go in there. Right. And start using everything that you've already learned, even though it feels like you're lost. Um, there's so much that you do know. Now I want to point a question from Lizbeth um, to Destiny, one of our panelists today. Um, what are some books, trainings, tools? I know these are the million dollar questions that you would recommend to a new school social worker and then to some of us that haven't heard um, of, of these tools. So I'm going to pass it to Destiny. Hello. Hey, everyone. So um, one of the biggest things I'll say, uh, number one tool is to make sure that you stay connected with everyone that is involved with the students. So parents, um, some of your students with um, specifically anger management, anxiety and depression, they may have a therapist or a psychiatrist. So definitely um, with consent, staying in contact with those individuals as well so that you all can help um, the student. Um, another thing I like to do, especially for my students with um, anger management, um, anxiety and depression 
as well is I like to have a fact sheet so that they know, hey, what is it? First of all, um, how does my body respond to it? Like, do I notice any cues um, when I feel angry or when I feel sad or when I feel nervous? Um, and then ways uh, that they can cope. So I like to either have them tell me things that they like to do um, or just give them a list of many different things to try and see if any of those things help them. So I love to do that with my students, especially that have anger management um, um, issues. And then uh, another thing, uh, for some students that like to do uh, worksheets, I like to use Therapist Aid. They have some really good worksheets on there and some good videos as well. So I really love to use Therapist Aid. Um, there's a, another website called Positive Psychology that also has some good um, games if you like to do games with the students as well. Um, I love to do, I have a little card game called What Would You Do? And it has really good scenarios on there as far as like, you know, friends taking your toys or um, friends saying mean things to you or things to do with their siblings and family members um, being mean to them. How do I respond to that? And so I like to um, have them go ahead and tell me like, hey, what would you do? Um, and then we kind of work through, okay, what can we do better? What might we change about that? Um, and sometimes it works. Sometimes, of course, they still struggle with that. But um, if they come into my office and they're angry, um, I like to use fidgets. I have a lot of fidgets in my office. So making sure that you keep those fidgets around so that they can play with those. Um, if you're able, I do have like a punching bag in my office as well. It helps a lot for my students because um, I do do middle school. So it, it does help a lot. They come in there a lot for that. Um, and then just figuring out what the student likes to do. Like some of my students like to come in and do art when they're angry um, or when they feel sad. So uh, doing that as well. Uh, and lastly, I love doing group sessions for all of my students, anger, uh, anger management, depression, anything like that. I love doing groups with them. Um, so first, that they know that they're not alone. And second, they'll be able to work through actual scenarios um, and figure things out. <laughs> Right. That's awesome. And that was one of the questions was um, from Alicia that was asking, like, what are resources for helping teens with anger, anxiety, depression? So you found that groups is really helpful? Yes. Yeah. Especially with anxiety. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much, Destiny. And I have your information on the screen as well, because I know you have a space that I love the aesthetic of your space as well. It's just like calming and cool at the same time. So I do see you if you kind of need some like, I, I like trendy stuff and you kind of check out Destiny's page, especially if you're working secondary, because <laughs> I'm like, how do I stay trendy with these kids? So thank you so much for everything you share on your social media as well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, awesome. I'm going to try to get to some of these questions in the chat as well as they're coming in. Um, another question coming in uh, from Allie is, what has been an intervention that you came up with, maybe on the spot? She kind of wants to know on the spot, right? We've talked about that. Um, like how Joyce was saying, can't put, you played with dinosaurs the whole time. <laughs> it's like, or, or maybe you can, but you know, I think it is one of those things that other staff look at us like, that's all you do, but there's just so much. So an intervention, if anybody has one that you came up on the spot with, that just went better than you expected really well and and how did it work does anybody want to tackle that I have an idea to share that's popping up to you on the panel I have one so um this was a time I was working in an elementary school and if anyone's worked in an elementary school you may be familiar with a young person getting upset and ripping down a bulletin board yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all we all know what that's about right, right. so um, I think it was a second grader so he had ripped down the bulletin board in front of his classroom because he was upset about something I don't remember what it was so I come down they call me downstairs he was my student and I'm like wow well, okay what do we have here so everything is like all up and down the hallway the teacher's all upset because she worked on this bulletin board so I wanted him to regulate himself by doing some deep breaths, but I knew just asking him to do the deep breaths right then and there would not work. So I start blowing the, um, you know, the little items from the bulletin board that were on the floor. I start just blowing them down the hallway back toward the bulletin board. So then he joins in. So he's doing deep breaths, but he, I'm kind of making it a game, you know? So we're blowing all the pieces down back to the bulletin board. By the time we blow them all to the bulletin board, then I get a stapler and we start stapling. We, we're putting the bulletin board back together. And then at that point, he's kind of calming down. I'm asking him what happened. He's, you know, telling me the story. And by the time we put everything together, he was calm. He was able to apologize and go back into class. Um, so doing those deep breaths by kind of making it into a game and not just going 
going down there and saying, well, what happened? And, you know, sometimes we can focus on the problem instead of meeting the student where they're at in that moment. And that's what I did. I kind of just came up with it in the moment and it worked. That's perfect. And I think when you mentioned that um, one of our panelists too, Lillian too, is saying like blowing bubbles. I do keep bubbles on my desk too, because um, it's it's mindful to kind of breathe and slow down the breath. You can't blow bubbles, splashing, you know, the bubble solution in your face. So like just getting them down. I like that meeting them where they're at instead of reacting. Um, it's very easy to react. You'll find a, a lot of staff and teachers and admins just reacting and you can't blame them they're dealing with you know 30 kids at once or whatever it is um and we kind of are used to the one-on-one -on -one. that's why i trust to do school social work because there's no way i could be as classroom teacher it's too much um and that's our skill is we're able to kind of come in and meet them where they're at so thank you that's a great one any others before i move into our next panelist directed question i have a middle school one that i did so um i usually get students that come in more with like panic attacks and they're able to express that. Whereas the younger ones, like Jocelyn was saying, is they kind of just react. Um, middle schoolers do, but sometimes they're able to verbalize it. I use a lot of grounding. So I did have a student come in super anxious. She couldn't really regulate, even though, you know, we've gone over coping skills. She knows what she should be doing. So um, I just went in for grounding and I just did the colors. So I was like, oh, can you point out how many, um, red things are in this room and she'll just kind of start pointing them out counting uh walking over to them so that's kind of like using your body and um i guess in a way using mindfulness to right regulate and then slowly everything else started to follow and calm down as i chose different colors so when that happens i usually tell students like you can do this in the classroom if you're starting to feel a little on edge like pick a color start counting pick an item start counting and it's kind of subtle no one's going to pay attention to you doing it so thank you for sharing even i heard your social work voice come out and i love that it's like calmed me down i love that so much great and then i see sarah ran and grabbed something please show us sarah i know i couldn't resist these scales which you can get at um target i have like a, a lakeshore set of scales right like just because i like to keep them around because I love toys. That's what I do. Um, but to you, I've used it with um decision making. So I remember having like a, a fourth or a fifth grader, gosh, ages ago, come in and you know, they're trying to just work through one of those decisions, right? Like, oh, like there were no safety issues involved. But and so we started weighing it out, like pros and cons. So just to like build some kind of the decision making skills of what are some of the pros? This Get yourself a good set of scales because it's a treat to use it with kids of all ages, kinder through high school, but you can find these for like much cheaper. But um, yeah, so I keep like coins around or rocks or like anything so that as we're doing like our pros and cons and we're talking it out, they can start to like see the visual. So I scales, so many fun that. ways. Yeah, it's like very visual, very visual to see. Um, our next panelist, I, I got a few questions. I mean, the questions y'all asked when you registered as part of the little prompt are so insanely good. And this one, I was like, I need to invite my clinical comadre on here to answer some of these. Um, so we have a social worker, yes, not necessarily in schools, but I'm like, please, you need to share your resource, who you are, if others don't know you, because she works specifically with grief. And I think that's one of the hardest things. That's something like a lot of school counselors, they don't touch grief. Like I, we have the crying kids in our classes and it's, it's hard. It's life is hard. So I do want to introduce you to um, a resource today. That's uh, Yolanda of Clinical Comadre and then ask her one of the panelist questions. Well, a few of them. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a few. I hope that's okay, Yolanda. Um, but the first is what intervention, speaking of quick interventions, what about students with eating disorders like that's a tough one and i had a few this past year what would you suggest um for interventions when you're seeing a student dealing with that great thank you um so eating disorder treatment like if you know nothing about it have never treated it before it can feel very scary and um i would say it is a specialized thing to treat but i would say you want to start or goals should include at least these two things. You want to really work on improving their body image. And I would ask questions, those open-ended questions to start a discussion around, first of all, how does social media influence their self-concept self and their self-image? 
And also, I always like to ask about their culture or ethnic background, because they can be hearing different things at home than what they're seeing on social media. And I would want to know, like, what are you seeing at home? Or what is your family? Talk, how does your family talk about their bodies and whatnot? And versus what they're seeing on social media or what their idea of beauty is around that. Um, because they may be feeling conflicted between these two different things that they're seeing or hearing. And mm -hmm. they may not know what to do with that. And another thing is also um, providing psychoeducation to the parents. Like, hey, your child is listening and what you say and how you say it matters, how you talk about your body. I think like I remember growing up um, hearing just like my mom and my aunts talk about their bodies a certain way. and they're, you know, obviously the students are listening and they may take that to school and share what they hear at home, of course. And the second thing, um, if you all are familiar with DBT, uh, DBT has a whole curriculum for disordered eating and that can be really helpful. I like DBT because it gives you like the solid interventions to use and it can be helpful. Um, for example, mindful eating is one where you're like eating a um, a gummy bear, for example. What does it taste like? How does it feel on my tongue? What am I noticing? Somebody mentioned some more somatic things like how does my body feel as I'm eating this? Because we also want to teach them um, healthy eating habits. And if they're not getting that at home, that can also be a really good intervention. And um, I think that was it for that one. Thanks. <laughs> Right. No, yes. I want to share kind of the different grade levels because we were kind of talking about what grade levels we're working with now this year. Sometimes it changes throughout the year. And so we kind of have a split, right? 38% of us are doing elementary work and then the rest of us are doing a lot of middle school and high school. And so one of the questions that came in was, how do you adjust to working with high school population, right? Maybe you've only worked with the younger elementary students. How, how what would you suggest to make that adjustment? It can feel intimidating at first. I think especially if you are working with the younger grades and going to high school, uh, don't be intimidated. Uh, I think the first thing is in my experience is just work on building rapport with them and even getting them to buy in, like coming to therapy or even agreeing to do it, especially if you're working with like 14 to 18 year olds. Um, yes, their parents may want them to do it, but they may not want to. So you just want to um, gain their trust and also thinking about where they're at in terms of um stages of development, they're figuring out who they are and what they like to do. And so I would really let them be the director of their treatment instead of like, hey, your mom wanted me, you wanted me to work on this with you. What do you want to work on? What do you want to improve on? Or, you know, why do you think your mom thinks you should be here? Um, and also it's okay to use humor and be sarcastic. I've totally done before, like, when um wanting to uh, or implement my intervention like hey can i just be a therapist for like a minute here i know we've been talking about this but let me just do my job real quick you know um so that's how i like just get sneak the intervention in and also i think when i was first starting i thought oh my god i have an hour with this student i have to do a whole hour of interventions what am i going to do or what if i run out of interventions it's okay to not do interventions the whole hour. You can socialize with them, ask them or find out their interest because if they they get told what to do all day long and they're told yes or no all day long in school. So that hour with you, like they can socialize a bit more or share their interest and that may be their only time where they're speaking to an adult and the adult is um, more on their level than versus being in the classroom. That is so true. I never kind of heard it that way, but it's true. I think that's why they want to come to our office so much is because we treat them at that level. And if you're reading the comments right now, it's be authentic, be yourself. That's what it is, right? Because they can cut straight through. Um, but I love that. And I think I'm going to use that. I've never tried that before. Like, let me be uh, uh, let me be a school social worker for a bit. Let me be a teacher for a bit. I'll put on that hat for a moment. Um, you know, cause that's kind of hard to, to play both roles, but I love how that you use that verbiage with older students. That makes sense. 
Thank you for sharing. One more question. Um, and then I'm going to pop your socials again, because that's so important um, for those that may not know Yolanda. But what interventions do you find can be the most effective to help with coping skills um, and like kind of improving behaviors? As you may know, with anger, um, a lot of our students are going to cover sadness and grief with anger, with outbursts. Um, and instead of trying to like limit that, it's it's coping skills that they're needing to help that behavior. So what what kind of interventions do you think we can use in schools to help? Definitely the psychoeducation of anger being a secondary emotion mm -hmm. and um, helping them figure out like there's lots of visual charts you can easily look up. Um, well, what's behind your anger? What's causing your anger? And helping them identify those primary emotions, because I find especially um, with the younger ones in my experience, like the only three emotions they're aware of are happy, mad, or sad when we know there's a large array of emotions and there's different intensities or severities we can experience those emotions. So really helping them learn more about the different feelings and anger, um, helping them figure out, well, what's behind it? What's causing this? Why am I feeling this way? What happened before I left for school this morning that may be contributing to my anger? Um, here at school. And I think um, giving them like easier, fun ways to remember the skills, because I'm not going to use like, like I mentioned DBT earlier, I'm not going to say, okay, we're going to do dialectical behavior behavioral therapy today. Um, one of my favorite ways to teach and help them to remember deep breathing is actually just putting my hand up and I'm tracing it like, okay, we're going to do this. As you inhale, you're going to trace your finger up. And as you exhale, you're going to trace it down. And um, you're just doing it the whole hand. That way they're taking in the five breaths. And it's an easy way to remember it. With my super younger ones that I had, I would be like, we're going to trace it. We're going to draw. We're going to draw your hand and practice the breathing that way. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is a very, you know, helpful. And hopefully I know everyone's kind of taking in everything that's coming through. So thank you so much for sharing those quick interventions that can help. Um, psycho that psycho information too. the, the just kind of helping our parents understand too I like that that's been mentioned we haven't even touched the parent piece and how much we work with community and parents as well um, I want to I have some more questions and I'm going to move over to our next panelist speaker and that's Bianca um, how do you help and kind of getting back to teachers and stuff how can you help with SEL curriculum and if you're new we're going to start hearing that <laughs> buzzword of SEL. Um, so I want to kind of pass that to Bianca to see some of her thoughts on helping teachers and staff with the curriculum. Hey y'all, so I'm Bianca um, and I've actually been tasked with SEL at the last two districts that I've been at and I love SEL. Um, I think that having a strong SEL program um, helps us in the end, right? Because it, it kind of helps those tier one, low level tier two students able to regulate once they start learning these skills, right? Every week through their classrooms. Um, so I think it's really important that we do support teachers because in the end, us providing that support really takes off. I mean, our case, so it's never going to be small, but it does help uh, take some of those students off or uh, maybe reduce a little bit of the referrals we get. Um, really, when I support teachers doing SEO, it comes in two parts. It's first is a logistical part, right? Um, if your district purchase an SEO curriculum, helping them set up that like their account, um, kind of showing them how the lessons work. And this doesn't mean that you go to every single teacher, right, and go to their classroom because we don't have time to do that. Um, but maybe send an email with all the links. Like this is the link that you can watch to show you how to set up your account. Um, um, giving them the resource or walking them through how to use the website. So when they do need help troubleshooting and you are not available, um, that they know where to go, where those links are, uh, where they can kind of figure that out on their own. Um, I'm very lucky we have a good, strong counseling office now um, where I can get our office aides to help us print handouts, um, you know, put them in teachers boxes. And I also make sure that I remind like through our newsletters or through emails, like this week we are on lesson. 3.1, right, of the curriculum uh, for this week, um, or sending reminders on their calendar so that, that they know um, where we are, right? And um, I think someone touched on this earlier, right, about understanding that their priorities are different, and you are probably going to get a little bit of pushback, right, because 
they're graded or rated or evaluated on diff completely different things than we are as professionals, right? And ultimately, at least in my state of Texas, a lot of that comes from testing scores, right? Um, how did they produce? Um, so when they're like, oh, great, now I have to follow all these curriculums for English, math, whatever. Now you're asking me to also do SEO, right? And so um, understanding that you are going to get some pushback and maybe we know that it's so beneficial for our students. And at the end, it does improve academic performance and, you know, behavioral disruptions in the classroom. Uh, but at that moment, maybe they feel like oh, just another thing I have to add to my schedule. So understanding that and not taking it personal, right? It's not like, oh, I don't like what the social worker is doing. Um, it's that that they already have a lot of other things on their plate. The second part of it is more helping them build their own uh, skills in the classroom. SEO, the most basic thing is to be able to help students regulate while they're learning um, or while they're going through all this stuff, right? We expect students to come in um, regardless of the situation at home, you know, whatever's going on and, you know, learn um, and sit in class. And that can be really difficult. Um, and so when a teacher is also dysregulated and also does not have a uh, coping skills. It causes a lot of tension in the classroom, right? So helping teachers like, okay, when a student does push your button, what can you do? How can you handle that, right? Um, so that they also feel like we're addressing their needs, right? Like Lauren said, like they have 30 kids, you know, we do groups and yeah, sometimes our groups are a little bit bigger, but you know, we get a lot of that individual time, right? Small group settings. But when you have 30 kids that are dysregulated, you are also dysregulated. Um, I think it's showing teachers like, what can you do to get you back centered? If that means that you co-regulate during class, you know, you're co-regulating, right? We're all going to take a deep breath right now. Um, we're all going to take a break. Uh, we're going to take a 30 second break, right? To get back on track. But it's helping teachers know those skills because, um, you know, you, I know when I was in school, SEO wasn't a thing. We didn't all, you know, do a tier one intervention where the whole school got these skills. So a lot of adults did grow up and not gain those skills. So I think helping them, uh, that's the second part, helping them regulate their own emotions. That's so true. You're right about that. Um, one of the other uh, questions from Jennifer was more like middle school focused, right? Again, secondary. Any uh, recommendations for like lesson plans, instructional classroom type, like focusing on that social emotional? So when it, um, I've seen when a student gets to I, I and I'm going to say this and maybe this you can disagree. Right. But middle school, I think, is like a, the roughest transition for a child besides the time they turn like 18. Right. After, and going to adulthood. But it's a time where you don't kind of have what I say, forced friends. Right. Elementary. You have friends because you are forced to be in a classroom all day with the same people, right? You go to middle school and now you're kind of picking your friends because you have eight, seven periods, right? You're kind of figuring out more of your own identity, right? Who do I click with? Um, so I think the most important part, one of the most, right? I think it's two things, but first is showing them social awareness. So anytime I get, get into a classroom, right? It's, yes, you have all these big feelings, uh, but how are these feelings impacting your relationships now, right? Um, if you, most kids, like we said, right, leave elementary knowing the basic emotion. So they know happy, sad, mad, right? Um, but now we're going to a place where they're maybe they're happy and sad and they're like, whoa, this is the first, right? That emotions are getting complicated, hormones are changing. Um, so I think knowing that, yes, we're looking in, but also how is that now, right? So when you do get mad, you can't just cuss your friend out and then expect your friend to be okay with that, right? And sh showing them like, how do you know what to do when you're upset? Um, also, psychoeducation is really big, right? Um, for us, like we've been through, right? we know what a trigger is. We can define a trigger and we know what kind of triggers us. But I mean, at this stage, kids are getting mad and they have no idea, like, well, I really don't know what the root, like what well, she just talked about. I mean, that pissed me off, right? Sorry, but that's right. Talking like a kid talks. And I'm like, okay, what about it is so upsetting to you, right? And so I'm like, well, it made me feel betrayed, right? A different word, right? Not like, oh, I'm just mad at them. Like, okay, yeah, that's understandable, right? So when you have the chance, the opportunity to be in a classroom and give a whole classroom lesson, I think it's important to introduce new emotional vocabulary, right? Um, besides just happy, sad, mad, what triggers you? What makes you feel anxious? What's a coping skill? Um, so I think that's really important and knowing how that affects others, right? Because middle school is like a little zone of bullying. It can be if the school culture is not positive and knowing like, hey, yeah, you were mad, but when you said that, that hurt the other person's feeling as well, right? And how is that impacting other relationships around you that's causing drama? Um, and just letting them know that 
yeah, things are changing for you, but also for all other 500 students in this school, right? And learning that and identifying where those big feelings are coming from. I feel like I went on a lot of tangents, but I hope that made sense. No, it's perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, I do have another question that are coming in, right? Some really good questions because I think we're realizing there's just so much to be done. Um, Vicky was asking how you how how to manage it, right? Tips on managing, um, setting those professional boundaries and trying to avoid burnout because there's so many referrals and different things like that. So I'm gonna put that out to Destiny, Bianca. And I see some of our panelists that are answering in the chat as well. So just kind of open that up um, to Destiny and Bianca to kind of share a little bit of how do you manage that balance boundaries? I think someone said definitely have a referral system because the hallway conversations can be a lot, um, right? Like a teacher and then we get it like they're busy. They don't want maybe fill out the Google form or whatever, but it's really important because then you're like, this is, this is not a me thing. Right. And um, as Sandra said, like not everything is an us thing, like there some things are not for us to deal with. Right. And, we, you know, we have to set the boundaries in knowing and also having the conversation with admin, like what do you expect me to respond to? What is the priority, especially if you're um, a general ed social worker? Right. Um, because every student on campus or three campuses, for example, I work at three, right, are, are mine. But I'm not going to serve 1,800 students. There's just no way. Um, or I won't be able to see them one-on-one, -on -one, right? So it's knowing, like, what are the priorities for that campus, right? Or, okay, your priority is the students that came back from DEP. Okay, then that would be a priority, right? Crisis is obviously always a priority. Um, but understanding what that campus needs and really setting up a strong referral system. Yeah. And I definitely um, agree with Bianca as far as having priorities. So each year we do um, a needs assessment. And in that needs assessment, um, it lets us know which students are high risk, medium risk, and low risk. Um, and so once we get that data back, I kind of make sure that my caseload is really, really focused on the high risk students and what their needs are. Um, it's in the medium risk as well. Um, for some of my medium and low risk, I do go ahead and share that document with uh, leadership. So like assistant principals, our school leader, um, and, and let them know like, hey, if you see this student, can you just do a quick check-in, especially if they're low risk, just asking how they're doing. Um, so that's definitely um, a big one for me. So yeah. <laughs> Mute myself. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. That's kind of, you know, a little bit to share as far as managing it all. Um, open to all the panelists. Um, Self-care, maybe your, your best tip for taking care of yourself and doing this work and balancing work and life and our own families, our own stuff. Um, any tips that we have for everyone tuning in on how you practice self-care, something you find works? And I'll just open this up to everyone. Um, I can answer first the, so I know people say this all the time. People will be like, do not put your district email on your phone. Um, that didn't work for me. Like, I think that's great advice. If you can do it, that didn't work for me because I was rarely in my office. So people would email me when things came up, like as a not immediate crisis situation, because that's what my talkies for, but like hey, like when you have a chance today, do this. And I'm not in my office to check my email. So I need to be able to like look at it on my phone. But on my phone, especially if you have an iPhone, you can set focuses so that it doesn't give you notifications after a certain time. So I would turn off all of my work-related notifications, like my calendar, my email, all of that after like 4.30 every single day. And then on weekends, all of my notifications would be off. And so that would be like my balance because it wasn't realistic to not have my email on there because that's just what worked for me. But if you don't have your email on there, it's even better. So I would say that would be number one. But if not, at least set boundaries on not answering things in the afternoon because if that becomes the expectation. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> so important. Any other um, on how you practice self-care? Um, I think it's, Right, we all know the different self-care things we like to do outside of work, but I think it's important to make sure you're implementing self-care throughout your day. Um, I messed up my back like the, for the last year and a half, so I've been dealing with that. And I kind of had to force myself to implement self-care through movement throughout the day. So like I've posted it on my stories, I bring my yoga mat and I like leave it next to my desk. And when I have like a second or I'm transitioning um, before seeing the next student, I might just sit on the yoga mat, 
I might do a couple of like movement snacks, like some cat cows, whatever. And then I'll just hop back up and get back to work. But I think just taking walks throughout the day to eating your lunch, I think somebody mentioned it in there, but we don't want to like burn out and then continue to go to the place that burns us out. It's just like a very unhealthy relationship. So I think um, finding ways to create that self-care within your day and like almost schedule it in. Yeah. Yes. No, very, very true. Any others? And I'm kind of popping in all of our contacts too, as we get closer to the end of this back to school kickoff. I know I'm feeling a lot better and grounded. I have a lot of notes to review because there's just been so much being shared, but any last on self-care for everyone here tuned in, and then we'll do our giveaway. I have a quick one to add. Um, At the end of the day, like either before when you, you know, you're shutting your office, closing your door, leaving the school, um, you could do something to um, kind of like a some sort of ritual or just routine to like establish like I'm leaving work now, because what happens is you can definitely take work home and 10 p.m. you're trying to go to sleep, you'll start thinking about that one student, I hope they're okay, Um, do something like, okay, I'm turning my light off, like work mode, we're done, something like that, I like to sweep myself, um, if that makes any sense at all, because um, we carry a lot of stuff like energies of others. So do something that's going to um, help like almost cleanse yourself or symbolically, metaphorically, you know, um, get rid of like the work day and everything that may have been placed upon you. I love that. And I did start incorporating some of those kind of holistic and um, our own like cultural, right? Which I, it's a whole nother. That's why I think we connected is you, sh- you share a lot of that too on your page. And thank you for that. Cause that's so important. Like Sage, other, other thoughts, right? Not always your EBT, but other things too. Thank you. Um, okay. Any others, any last others, if you're kind of thinking self-care wise, cause that's super important to keep going and keep doing the work. I really worked hard last year on professional self-care. So I already knew the stuff that I like to do outside of, um, the school building. But when I was in the school building, um, for the first time ever, I actually used my days off. So like if I woke up and had a really bad headache, instead of pushing through, I would take the day off. Whereas before I would just unless I like literally couldn't crawl out of bed, there was no way I was missing work. And so that made a huge difference for me, um, as did just making sure that um, my office space, um, and I've done this even when I had a really suboptimal office space, my office space this past year was not bad, but um, just making it a place I wanted to be. So like I turn off, I have lots of lamps, I turn off the overhead, I have my lavender spray, so it smells good, just whatever for you personally, you know, the things on the wall, I like the way that, you know, they make me feel good when I see them, just things like that make a huge difference for me. And, um, you know, just being able to even just those little moments between sessions, being able to just sit and be like, I'm in like a space that feels calm to me, even if work is crazy. And um, that feels really good. And then the last thing that I incorporated um, last year for the first time is taking a second before responding to a crisis. So I used to be the social worker who was like with the walkie talkie sprinting down the hallway the second I get a call. Um, And now I realize um, with like very few exceptions, there's an adult who can handle the situation for at least one to two minutes. So like stopping, taking a breath, take, if I kind of have to go to the bathroom because I don't know how long it's going to take me to, to deal with the crisis situation, I'll do that. Or I'll fill up my water bottle to bring it with me or grab a granola bar to bring with me or whatever. Um, just taking just like literally a minute or less before I respond to a crisis was also super helpful for me. That is so true. And I love, I was reading the chat over here and I think um, Sandra said it too. It's like, someone will be there to handle your high flyers. It's not all on you. It's so important. And it's great to hear that and normalize that as well. Thank you so much. I want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers. They're all on the screen right now. Please, please be be sure that you are following them. 
um, that you are kind of grabbing from their resources, getting on their email lists, things like that. There's just such uh, um, so so much knowledge and insight as you've seen today, and we're all here to support you throughout the year with different um, different things that we're putting out there into this space. So thank you so much. Thank you. I have a little survey as you exit out, and we are going to do our giveaway. Um, but again, I just want to say thank you to all of these speakers for giving their time today. Super, super helpful. So thank you so, so much. Of course, subscribe to my channel on YouTube.